Okay, we're going to look at uh, in kind of an interesting text, not one you'd ordinarily pick for Thanksgiving, but I thought it works really well. The 20th uh, and 21st verses of the 17th chapter of Luke. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and he answered, The kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed. Nor will they say, look here, look here it is, or there it is. For in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I was in the doctor's office last week and I uh, struck up a conversation with a, a young woman and she confided to me that she was thinking about starting a new business. She's a trained therapist. She's done family counseling and marriage counseling and so forth. She said, I'm going to start up a, a new business where I counsel people only on the telephone, by telephone. And she said, my, my clientele is going to be different. I'm not going to counsel anybody that is depressed or that's dealing with anxiety. If they have marital problems or family issues or problems with their children, I'm going to refer them to someone else. She said, I'm just going to counsel with people who are bored. (laughs) People who are bored. I I thought that was interesting. And I guess she saw the, the incredulity in my face. And she said, you wouldn't believe how many people there are who there's nothing wrong with their lives at all, except they're just literally bored. They're bored to death. And she said, I'm going to do life coaching for them. I can encourage them and give them some ideas about how to organize their life. She had it all planned out. I got to thinking about that. I, I, you know, I think uh, maybe she's right. Now, some of you may be going through crisis right now or have a huge challenge in your life. I estimate that at any one time it, with any group of people, about 50% of us are going through some kind of major crisis or at least a big challenge. And you might be thinking, wow, what I would give for just one boring day, right? Give me just one boring day, a peaceful day where nothing big happens. But let me tell you, I, I've been thinking about this. And if you take one boring day and you, you follow it with another boring day and you string a few boring days together and you get out 365 days of boring days, then that expression, bored to death, will have meaning for you. It'd be pretty tough, wouldn't it? You literally would be bored to death. So I was thinking about that when I read this scripture. Jesus has uh, come to this place and the Pharisees have surrounded him. And they they ask him this question. They say, Jesus, when is the kingdom of God going to arrive? And he gives them a really unique and powerful answer. He says, people are looking here and there for the kingdom of God. But let me tell you something. The kingdom of God has already arrived. It's right here in your midst. One of the reasons I I thought about this is that you talk about a group of boring people, those were the Pharisees. When you look back through history, the Pharisees had to be the most boring group of people who ever lived. And I'll explain to you why. The Pharisees were the ones out of the Jewish community who were experts on the law. They read the law, they memorized the law, they analyzed and interpreted the law, and they looked around, they pointed their fingers at everybody else who wasn't following the law. And here's the deal. When we talk about the law in the Jewish faith, we're not just talking about the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal, shalt not kill, shall, you know, uh, honor your mother and father. The law was much more than that. In the Hebrew tradition, the law uh, involved almost everything that the Jews did on a daily basis. I mean, everything had to be ritually purified in a certain way. So if you want to know about this, you can go and look, uh, read the book of Leviticus. It's the third book in the Old Testament, I think. The Pharisees were experts on the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus are all of these instructions about how to do everything in a kosher or a religiously legal way. And I have to tell you, it is the most boring book in the world. True confession, I've never read through Leviticus from beginning to end. Denise said after the service, she said, I can't believe you admitted that. But it's the truth. I've never read through Leviticus. I just couldn't do it. And I don't recommend it, frankly. Uh, <laughs> it's that boring. Now, if you've read through the Leviticus from, from beginning to end, I just want to say congratulations. You're a great biblical scholar. 
But if you've read through Leviticus from beginning to end and you enjoyed it, you are possibly the most boring person in the world. (laughs) It's just not that interesting. And so here's this group of scholars, these legal experts surrounding uh, Jesus, and I suspect that they literally were bored to death. Maybe some of them were going through a crisis of some kind, some huge challenge in their life. But for the most part, they were living really dull, meaningless lives without much purpose whatsoever. And they say, Jesus, tell us when the kingdom of God is going to arrive. In other words, they were pretty much just like you and me. Because isn't it true that nearly all of us are in a kind of holding pattern in life? We've talked about this a lot uh, here at Christ Church. We tend to be in a holding pattern, always waiting for the next big thing that's going to to come and rescue us from our boredom or from our crisis, from our depression or our anxiety. And so we wait for the next big thing. It might be graduation from high school or college. It might be finding the right person uh, to get married to. Maybe finding that perfect job or accumulating enough money for retirement. Or maybe just that moment when you get out of whatever crisis that you're in. We tend to to get ourselves into these holding patterns and we think that at some point the kingdom of God is going to arrive and when it does, everything will be fine from then on. The fairy tale ending. You know what I'm talking about. And of course, what we discover in the long run is either that moment does not arrive or it does arrive And the satisfaction doesn't last long because sooner or later there's either another crisis or there's more boredom. And so unfortunately, a lot of us spend our lives in a holding pattern just waiting, waiting. You remember that uh, famous play, Samuel Beckett's play, Waiting for Godot? It's probably at least 50 years old now. It's kind of the theater of the absurd. It was about two men, and they are on center stage the whole time. And and they're waiting for somebody named Godot. Probably Beckett's play on the word God. And they're waiting for Godot, and there's the first act, and the second act, and the third act. And Godot never arrives, and the play ends. And you're wondering, well, what did this mean? It's a play about the absurdity of waiting. And yet that's where most of us find ourselves oftentimes, just in a holding pattern, waiting for the next big event in our lives. Jesus says, you should celebrate now because the kingdom of God is in your midst. I think it's one of the most important things that Jesus ever said. There were Christians then, there are Christians now who believe that the kingdom of God is not to be found until uh, beyond, you know, beyond the grave. Jesus himself said, the kingdom of God can be celebrated right here and now. I've been thinking about this wonderful image that um, Dr. Alice McKenzie gave us. I I don't know whether you were here two weeks ago, but if you were here two weeks ago, Dr. Alice McKenzie, she's such a brilliant preacher, preached uh, 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 about uh, jumping out of an airplane, a skydiver. And that, for her, was a kind of metaphor for what it means uh, to be alive. To jump out of an airplane and to be, uh, uh, you know, floating down through the air. She had a, she had a graphic uh, when she was here a couple of weeks ago. It was kind of a dull uh, black and white graphic of a person with a parachute. I looked through, Ben and I looked through, and, and I found a graphic of my own. This is a, a full color. It's quite a bit better than Alice's. Uh, but I don't want you to blame Alice. Um, I, I just happen to be uh, quite a bit more technologically advanced uh, than she is. And somebody said between the services, Alice was probably reading through Leviticus, so she didn't have the time to look around like, you know. <laughs> but I love this image. I love this image as a metaphor for what it means to be alive. Because you see the concept of jumping out of an airplane and, and floating down to the earth uh, reminds us of our mortality, doesn't it? 
I mean, I, we don't use that word very often. I remember when I was a freshman in college at Southwestern University in Georgetown, I was in Dean Berglund's class on Shakespeare. And I don't remember which play we were reading or which sonnet maybe, but I guess uh, Shakespeare used the word martel. And Dean Berglund stood in front of us, about 30 of us, and he said, how many of you know what the word mortality means? And not a single one of us raised our hands, not one. We were 18 years old. We thought we were going to live forever. But of course, we, we know that we don't. And so I, this is a wonderful image, this idea of jumping out of the airplane. Some people may jump out at 4,000 feet, others at 7,000, others at 12,000. In other words, the journey for some of us is briefer. For others, it's really a long journey. But this one thing we know, sooner or later, we're going to hit the ground. Sooner or later, we're going to hit the ground. And so the question for us, when it comes to this journey that we call life, the question for us is how are we going to spend our time? How are we going to spend our time in that journey? Um, Dr. McKenzie talked about, she gave us some examples. She talked about the Pharisees, as a matter of fact. She said, here you can see people jumping out of the airplane. And she said, here's the two Pharisees right over here. They're coming down, but they're so busy doing the ritual washing of hands. And I'd say, you know, pointing around, looking at everybody else who isn't following all the rules. She said, they're so distracted, they forget to pull the rip card. And here's the rich man over here. And he's, he's floating down and, and he's hold, trying to hold on to his stuff. He's working so hard not to drop any of his stuff that he's really missing out on life itself. And I'll add some more examples to that. You know, here's, here's the person that's floating down and they are consumed by jealousy because somebody got a better start than they did or has a, a nicer parachute than they and they just can't get it out of their mind that they're, there's somebody else out there that has an advantage over them. And then there's the person who is floating down and they're just angry. They're angry and they won't let it go. It's because somebody said something or did something to them at the beginning of the journey. And they're unwilling to just let it go. And so they're consumed as they come down. They don't enjoy the journey. There's the issue of boredom. Sometimes people just use up their lives being bored. I remember when I was a little boy, a neighbor friend of mine went with his family to visit, uh, to visit the Grand Canyon. And I thought, boy, how great. I, I couldn't wait to see the Grand Canyon. And when he came back, he gave me a report. He said, oh, don't go. It's not a very big deal. He says, it's just a great big hole in the ground. I went to the Grand Canyon after that. What a remarkable, how could anybody describe that as a big hole in the ground? What a remarkable and powerful expression of God's creative power. One of the most beautiful places you'll ever lay eyes on. And so I think about people that are making the trip down and they're floating and they've only got so much time and they look around and they're surrounded by this remarkable beauty, God's creation, but they don't see it. They don't see it because they're so obsessed with their own issues, their anger, their jealousy, or because they're just so bored, they're not even looking. And in this powerful verse, Jesus reminds us, guess what? The kingdom of God has already arrived. Open your eyes and celebrate. Give thanks and celebrate. I'll have to tell you that after all of these years of preaching and reading and, and trying to figure out what life is all about, there are not very many things that I'm perfectly sure of, not very many at all. But one thing I am convinced of, and that is that the only way to live life well is with a sense of gratitude. It is gratitude or thanksgiving that transforms our lives and everything and everyone that is in our lives. Gratitude is the key 
to the life well lived. Last week on Thursday, I went with my wife, Bobby, to uh, Denton, to my grandson's little grade school in Denton. It was their Thanksgiving Day celebration, so they invited the parents to come over and bring food. Liam volunteered, he calls his, he call, her name is Bobby, but he calls her Baba. He volunteered his Baba to make the turkey and dressing, of course. So we had a 20 pound turkey and so we took all this stuff over there and it was, it was a great time. Other parents were there and we fed all these children and met his teacher. It was wonderful. But I was looking around the classroom and talking with the kids. And of course, they'd been studying about the pilgrims and the Indians and uh, Thanksgiving, the first Thanksgiving. And they had their artwork out there. Uh, Liam had drawn a little picture of a teepee. It was on fire. Uh, <laughs> But they, they, learned, they learned what most of us learned back when we were in grade school about the early pilgrims. And this is the way they thought it happened. It had been a great growing season through the summer and the harvest had been bountiful. There was so much food. And so the pilgrims invited the Native Americans to sit at this big banquet table and it was overflowing with turkey and dressing and venison and corn and other kinds of vegetables and fruit. It was a huge celebration. But of course, that's not the way it happened. What we know is that in the fall of 1621, those early pilgrims came to what came to be Thanksgiving at a moment in their lives where they had buried over half of their number. During the last year, over half of them had died. They'd dug seven times more graves than huts that they had built. And contrary to popular history, the harvest had been meager. Barely enough to provide a survival through the winter. And yet... In the knowledge that the journey had not been perfect, it had not been painless, they nevertheless sank to their knees and gave thanks to God. They gave thanks to God for the gift of life, for the gift of one another, for the knowledge that they were not alone, that Christ was with them, for the knowledge that the kingdom of God was remarkably and miraculously in their midst, they gave thanksgiving, they celebrated. So should we, so should we.